Hello, welcome back to the fourth video in the Expert Skills Program Self-Study Block. Here you will learn what to avoid as well as what to do in order to change your brain to improve your learning skills. You'll understand exactly how to design your own study to make learning happen the way you want it to. Before we begin, remember that filling out the study guide during the video helps you get the most out of what you're viewing. In order for you to change your brain, you will need to achieve two main requirements. First, during your waking hours, you need to study in a way that encourages branching of the brain nerve cells called neurons to produce interconnected networks. Then, during sleep, these networks will become stronger if you studied by acting on decisions. This process of converting what you study into stable, long-lasting networks is not restricted just to remembering what you are learning. It also applies to how you think about what you are learning. Thus, the back of the brain strengthens its networks that produce long-term memory. The front, by comparison, increases its speed as it strengthens its networks that are involved in decisions. The counterpart with a computer would be that long-term memory would be increased by getting a larger hard drive, but speed would be increased by getting a more advanced CPU. These increases in both memory and speed about what you are learning is based on neuroplasticity. It is the reason that the growth mindset works. Let's take a look at the events that happen when you're awake. As you proceed through the day, the neurons in your brain are constantly forming small protrusions on the dendrites called spines. In the next slide, you can see these spines along the dendrites. These neurons were stained so don't, that only the neuron and the dendrites with their spines are visible. The long axons are not visible here. It reveals that there are many spines formed as potential sites to link this neurons uh, this neuron with many others through connected network connections. The formation of spines is very dynamic, so they appear and recede, and they're only stabilized when they connect with another neuron through synapse formation. This dynamic formation of spines provides a virtually endless variety of connections to create the memory that is needed. The synapses and early dendrite branching continue to occur as you go through your normal daily activities, including your studying. The pattern of synapses is determined by what you give your attention to. It is this formation of synapses that allows you to pay attention so that you can carry on conversations or that you have enough memory to watch a video without forgetting it as it plays. But it's important to note that this memory that allows you to continue conversations and to remember things all day long is not long-term memory, or at least it isn't yet. In the next slide, you can see the spines and their formation of synapses. The black ellipse between the yellow arrows encloses some synapses that have formed from spines. Notice how several different neurons can link to a single neuron to form a network. The next slide describes what happens to those synapses during sleep. As you sleep, your brain goes through cycles of activity that can be identified by coherent wave patterns produced by the neurons firing together. The cycles proceed from shallow sleep to deep, slow-wave sleep. This 90-minute REM cycle is named for the shallow part of sleep where we dream. Since you normally wake up from REM sleep, you usually experience waking up from a dream. However, the evidence shows that strengthening of learning does not occur during dreaming. Instead, it occurs during the deepest sleep called slow-wave or non-dreaming sleep. During this period of sleep, you replay all of the past events or activities you have experienced while you were awake. I hope you'll notice that we're using terms like experience and active. 
It is during this part of the sleep cycle that active experiential learning results in what we call long-term learning. To continue with our story of the events that occur during sleep, one of two things happen as events are replayed. The synapses are either strengthened through a process called consolidation or they are pruned. The consolidation event represents the true point in time that learning occurs. As you might expect, any event that is pruned essentially never happened, and that could have been that chapter you spent a whole evening reading. But there is another aspect to consolidation that refers to the role of emotion. This is the deciding factor for consolidation or pruning. If emotion was associated with the replay, then consolidation results and this makes the synapses long-term. If no emotion is associated, then pruning results. In other words, you can't learn anything you don't act on. It should be clear by now that one major advantage of consolidation is that it obviates the need to keep relearning. This is built into our biology so that the brain keeps uh, synapses that it will need in the future. It doesn't take much imagination to see that time spent on action the first time you study avoids the need to spend additional time relearning later. It may interest you uh, that the newly consolidated synapses can last for two months and they're made even stronger with use. In the next few slides, we show the results on how consolidation is likely to occur. In the two slides that follow, we will illustrate the effect of sustained stimulation at the synapse and how it leads to gene activation of synapse or, or gene activation for the synthesis of synapse proteins. This sustained stimulation is provided by the replay of emotionally connected events during slow wave sleep, as we just said. This stimulation maintains a signal pathway that leads to gene activation and synthesis of the proteins needed to consolidate the synapse. Then the second slide will illustrate how the same signal pathway decays when there's no emotion connected with the event and replay does not occur. The message here is that active learning while you're awake determines what will, you will, hap what will happen when you're asleep. This slide is an excerpt from an article in the New England Journal of Medicine on Alzheimer's research. The sequence in this slide that we're interested in begins with the extracellular stimulus. This has been produced due to replay during sleep that is driven by emotion. Whenever you create something through active learning such as a table, a concept map, or even an ordinary outline, you create an emotional response. This may be a subtle emotional response, uh, let's say for a uh, concept map, for example, but the emotion is especially strong if your learning involves an interaction with others, like talking to a classmate about something you've just read. You can see that neuron stimulation activates the enzyme adenylate cyclase, and cyclic AMP, AMP is increased. This is a pathway I'm sure you're familiar with. The cyclic AMP binds to the protein kinase enzyme and activates it. The resulting phosphorylation activity of the protein kinase maintains the activation signal as long as the stimulation continues. The sustained replay during slow wave sleep sustains the signal pathway that eventually allows protein kinase A to diffuse into the nucleus to stimulate a transcription factor called CREB. This transcription factor then has a domino effect by activating a group of genes that make proteins needed to create a synapse. This is the basic physical change needed to consolidate the synapse. The effect of trying to learn without action is shown in the next slide. Any learning that is not active lacks an emotional connection needed for replay during sleep. That results in reduced stimulation of adenylate cyclase 
and the cyclic AMP signal is not maintained. This causes the protein kinase to revert to its inactive state, interrupting the signal pathway and preventing the activation of the Krebs transcription factor. No new protein synthesis occurs and the synapse weakens and disappears. The result is called pruning. At this point, you should be able to understand that you may have the impression you are creating memory since you recognize what you're reading. Remember, those synapses stay throughout the day, allowing you to comprehend what you're speaking or reading. But memory without action is simply an illusion, since it doesn't survive slow wave sleep. The end result of consolidation is shown in the next slide, which compares dendritic trees for neurons that have consolidated and those that haven't. Here we see a comparison of dendrite branching occurring in animals that have undergone learning compared to controls. Only the cell body and dendrites are stained in this preparation. The neurons in this experiment were isolated from the hippocampus, which is part of the emotional limbic system that assists the temporal lobes in processing long-term memory. The control neuron is shown on the left with a comparatively less dense, dense branch of uh, their, the dendrites or a branching structure. This would correspond to less integrative memory due to the lack uh, or the lower networking. It's <clears throat> the two neurons on the right are from animals that have been through a learning cycle exercise and then permitted to sleep. The length of sleep has been found to be important with the maximum consolidation occurring with sleep long enough to permit five REM cycles. This would be seven and one half hours of sleep. Now, before we leave the topic of consolidation, it is important to keep in mind that we have been focused on the formation of long-term memory that is stored in the back of the brain for later recall. But there is also evidence that the same proliferation of dendrites through networking also occurs in other areas of the cortex. For example, in the frontal area, we find that learning through active learning methods creates greater speed in thinking. You will notice that you get faster with certain study methods such as concept mapping due to the physical growth of synapses in your frontal lobes. The many studies on learning curves confirm this since learning curves also measure increased speed in performing skilled tasks. At this point, you likely have the impression that some kind of activity will guarantee that you will consolidate your learning after a good night's sleep. But I have to tell you this, it's still possible to be active and not achieve the learning that you're after. To understand how this can happen, let's take a look at your motherboard. This slide illustrates how each functional area of your cortex is connected by axon bundles called fasciculi. This is the same way a motherboard in a computer is interconnected by uh, soldered circuits. The fasciculi allow the front of your brain to communicate with the temporal area to recall needed long-term memory. Other fasciculi connect the front of your brain to the motor area for when you need to act on a decision. While all of these connections produce a means for all areas of your brain to communicate, it allows for short-circuiting around the front. This happens because the brain is designed to save energy. To do this, it unconsciously creates shortcuts that bypass the frontal cortex. You can recognize this in the way you automate any behavior that you have to repeat a lot. And when you consider how much reading you have to do, it is easy to see how sitting and reading can become quite automated. This is illustrated by the sitting and reading arrow that shows the route of communication from the sensory area to the temporal area where it will stay until memory recognition is needed. While just reading or listening doesn't communicate to the motor area, it also avoids the frontal cortex and any activity that would facilitate the consolidation of long-term memory. Let's look at the main points we've covered here. Changing your brain 
requires active learning that produces the emotion that drives consolidation during sleep. The time constraints in medical school require efficient, active learning methods that avoid short-circuiting the front of the brain. In our next two videos, you will learn about the two most efficient methods for developing expert learning skills, concept mapping and question analysis groups. I look forward to having you join me there.